thinking about it now, it's, it's um, as if I'm dreaming now and then I was awake. Then I was awake and conscious. I think they should call it a near life experience because it's more alive than I've ever been. Meet Pam Najur, a bright, outgoing, normal American, a musician's agent and mother in Atlanta, Georgia, who after years of suffering through intense headaches, was diagnosed with a brain aneurysm, entered the hospital to take part in a radical new surgical procedure, and while there, underwent something unique in the annals of the near-death experience. Unique not because of what she encountered, but because she was fully documented medically all the way. ...for her uh, surgery. And what we see here is the main artery coming up from the neck that's being injected with dye so that we can see it on the x-ray. And this artery bends around here and comes up into the brain itself. And you see this large bubble that's on the side of the artery. And this is the giant cerebral aneurysm uh, which was threatening Pam's life in which Dr. Spetzler uh, uh, clipped uh, during his procedure. I was taken in. I remember I was out cold when they wheeled me in. Completely out cold. So as of that time, I had no recollection of what anything looked like. So what do you know happened to you during the operation? Well, I know I heard a sound. And the sound was in a natural D. And the sound went from natural D and took a nosedive through the scale. And I popped out the top of my head. And then I was looking at the body, which was lying on a gurney. And I saw the surgeons, and I realized it was my body, but I did not connect with it as, and call it me, or think it was me. And now that seems very unusual, but while it was happening, it's, it was totally natural to look at it that way. The procedure is, and this is what Pam went through, uh, first, uh, she's uh, given uh, general anesthesia through an endotracheal tube. Uh, secondly, her femoral uh, vessels are cannulated, whereas where the tubes are put in there, and she's put on a cardiopulmonary bypass. Her body then is uh, cooled down to 58 degrees Fahrenheit. In the process of this cooling, uh, her heart stops, goes into ventricular fibrillation, and then completes standstill. Her head then is opened uh, and the aneurysm exposed at the base of the brain. At this point, her blood is drained from her head and her circulating blood volume is drained into the bypass machine and it's turned off. And so her brain is then without blood. It's without any electrical activity because EEG leads are hooked up. Her heart is stopped. She's not breathing and her body temperature is 58 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, she meets all of the criteria for physical death. And I became aware of, of a presence and I sort of looked at it and it was bright and glowing and it seemed a long, long way off. And I was in, I say it's like an elevator shaft. And at the end was this incredibly beautiful bright light I've never seen a light like that anywhere. It had, it was alive, it was uh, breathing, it, it was um, real warm and real comfortable and real loving. I wasn't at all afraid, it was wonderful. And as I got closer to the light, other presences began to come around me. And many I recognized as, as the people I had lost, who I was related to. The question, though, is that while she is cooled, while there is no blood in her brain, there's no electrical activity in the brain, where's Pam? Is Pam dead? Is Pam alive? Is Pam near dead? As I went into the light, towards the light, it refined itself it became harmonious 
and it was uh, liquid, silvery. There came a time I knew that it was time to come back through the tunnel, and I was there with the body again. I remember hearing a phrase from an evil song, you can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. I thought, that's terribly insensitive. That's <laughs> awful. <laughs> and, and then I was, my next conscious memory was opening my eyes and seeing my family around me. Tom Harper, theologian, Rhodes Scholar, journalist, and author, encountered this story when he was researching his best-selling book, Life After Death. Pam Najour is a special case, the exception that both proves and questions the rule. She was measurably dead, clinically unplugged, as it were, and then she came back to tell us about it. So, is it our measuring devices that need adjustment, or our notions about the nature of death and what it means? Good question. When I began the three years that it took to research my book, I knew there was no proof either for or against the existence of life after death. It's just as it is in the case with God. I saw my task then to be the assembly of the evidence, all of it, pro and con, to weigh it, and then to come to a rational conclusion based on a careful analysis of it. If you like, a kind of every man and every woman's common sense approach to the question. The one thing I can safely say that we've learned, the foundation stone, the central phenomenon of life after death studies today, is certainly the near-death experience. Pam Najur is only one of a vast crowd of people who tell of a near-death experience. 42% of Americans report some kind of contact with the dead. Sociologist Reverend Andrew Greeley Eight million Americans claim to have undergone a near-death experience. PMH Atwater, author of Coming Back to Life. Eight million Americans. And that may well be an understatement, since a great many people are reluctant to talk about their experiences. Even in more skeptical countries, the figures are similar. In England, 66% of nurses reported mystical events brought on by close involvements with people in their dying moments. An Oxford University study. These and other figures indicate a profound acceptance of the possibility of contact with the dead. But what exactly are we talking about? Assuming near-death experiences really happen, can we then make the jump into treating them as genuine, revelatory encounters with the hereafter? Many people are profoundly transformed by this experience who survive it. Their attitude toward life changes drastically. They become much more appreciative of the privilege of living. They become much more compassionate and loving toward others. They become much more spiritually open, not necessarily more religious after their experience. And one thing that's almost universal among these people is they lose their fear of death and lose it forever as a result of knowing that from their understanding, there is no death. The near-death experience, cast out of yourself, leaving your physical body, passing through unimaginable sounds, light, waves of feeling, overpowering visions of things you've never conceived of before, faces of the dead. Are you alive? And if you are, where are you going? How could anyone's life not be changed? How did I change as a result of my experience? Everything about me changed. Now I'm interested in people. I'm interested in, in what I can do to help their spirit. I changed as a human being. In many ways, I was very aggressive. I wanted to make money in that. And I realized the need for the materialism isn't important. I am determined to seek all the knowledge I can find about anything and to know God most of all. You do have a feeling of knowingness with the universe, oneness with the universe. And it's not because you're so special, it's because you wake up to who you truly are. I had to deal with, acknowledge, and accept that I am a spiritual being. My priority uh, now are personal relations, people, and, and my personal life. Uh, I was in the nightclub business in New York and in Florida. 
I had very successful nightclubs, and I was in a very hedonistic and materialistic lifestyle. I was partying and drinking champagne and going out with different girls all the time. It was a perfect uh, world that I lived in. Well, I got into an argument with a business associate in my nightclub. Listen, don't call me a cheat in front of my friends, okay? I think I can call and, you uh, we I started want. fighting. You be calling me a kid. I'm a bucket fix. It became quite serious. And I began to strangle him. And I was pulled away by a security guard. And all of a sudden, I heard my heart stop and my breathing stop at the same instant, the same moment. And I knew I was dying. I thought to myself, this is it. This is how it all ends. I was dead. I heard somebody shouting, we have no vital signs, we're losing him. And at that point, I found myself in an ambulance. I could hear the driver on the uh, two-way radio, and he was telling the hospital that they were on their way with a patient who just coded in the ambulance. I sensed that the ambulance was slowing down and the driver turned at this fork in the road and when he accelerated very rapidly I felt myself being propelled out of the top of the ambulance and I was hovering maybe 40 or 50 feet above the ground watching the ambulance going down this dark road my view was then drawn up toward the sky and I watched what I sensed to be a, a mass of energy forming in the sky right in front of me, like a black liquid, and it created this tunnel effect, like giant waves, like giant ocean waves funneling around. I heard this loud whooshing sound, and then I went up into this tunnel of energy, and as I went up through it, all of a sudden I was enveloped with this bright light, bright golden light, just surrounded me. Then the light became brighter and brighter, and it turned to a pure white light, radiant, beautiful light. And I knew I was in the presence of God. Ned Doherty felt that presence so strongly that he reformed and turned his life around spiritually on the spot. But here is what happened to a man, already a minister, who had always assumed he was in the presence of God, but found that it meant something different after his near-death experience. I was asleep, and I awoke about three in the morning with great pain. And then suddenly, I, I was being transported somewhere else. I remember looking back, just fleetingly, and I saw my wife asleep in bed and my body there. I was drawn into this, this uh, bright light, this, this ever-expanding, swirling tunnel of light. And it, and it was very much a feeling of, of returning to somewhere where I had been before. That, that I, it was like a coming home. Uh, I don't know. It, it was not frightening. It, it was very peaceful and exciting. That's what I remember. I remember the feelings of peace, gentleness, at oneness. And then, then suddenly, abruptly, I was back in that bed and back in that body. And, and I remember thinking, oh God, not this again. I was back in this physical body with its limitations. I was also back with my wife and my children and my, my pet dog and my home and all the persons and things that I enjoy in this life. 
but but I had had a glimpse of something else, and and all of that faded into uh, insignificance. And I, I don't mean to depreciate my family when I say that, but it did. It, it was no longer significant. None of that. Ken Martin had a glimpse of something else. Whatever he felt was so immense, so overpowering, that it made everything else, his wife, his kids, his calling, appear insignificant. One striking aspect of the near-death experience is the amazing variety of people who have had them. There are people of all religions and people who don't have any faith at all. Men, women, and children, good people, bad people, rich and poor, weak and strong. In the cases of Ned Doherty and Ken Martin, two quite different men, two quite similar experiences, and finally, two very different conclusions or lessons from them. It's obvious that the near-death experience, however powerful, affects everyone differently. But what does that mean? Does it indicate that the contents of the experience merely reflect the private imagination and are not universal? To put it another way, are they simply based in and confined to each individual's brain. I've no doubt at all that near-death experiences are profound life-changing events. They feel absolutely real to the people who have them. But underneath that, I think that it's all created by things going on in the brain. And if I want to understand what's happening in near-death experience, I personally will try to say what's happening in here, not look for some idea of a, of a soul leaving and going somewhere else. So I think it's a it's a real and important experience, but still, it's a brain-based experience. I strongly suspect that the experience of the near-death phenomenon and the conviction that there is an afterlife is tied to the intrinsic wiring of the human brain and a process that emerged evolutionary-wise as the sense of self occurred. Because at the moment the sense of self emerged, if it had believed that it would die, the apprehension would have been so significant it would have been fragmenting and the sense of human self would never have evolved the way it has. There's plenty of evidence that people do change after NDEs, but a lot of controversy about why. Most people seem to think it's because they've actually met God or they've been to heaven and so on. I don't think so at all. I think the, the really transforming aspect of an NDE is when it goes far enough for the ordinary sense of self to start to dissolve. One of the interesting things about the near-death experience is that the conditions bringing it about are associated with hypoxia. And we now realize that certain neurons die. Not all of them, a small subpopulation die. Which means that now the brain is microstructurally connected differently. And basically the microstructure of the brain is your personality. These small changes are occurring in the appropriate place can produce a change that will last more or less forever and the person will be and appears transformed. Well, those views sound perfectly reasonable from a scientific perspective, and yet they don't completely satisfy, I think. They leave some crucial elements out. They don't explain, for example, how a near-death experience can have measurable exterior effects. Take the example of Dr. Yvonne Kaysong. Well, in 1979, I was involved in a medical evacuation accompanying a critically ill native Indian woman uh, to a larger hospital. Our airplane flew into a blizzard, and uh, both of the propellers, the air filters, froze over, and we crashed onto the surface of a semi-frozen lake. The patient died. And so did Dr. Kaysom. But a bright, pure, blissful light enveloped her, took her out of her body, and soothed her. Her time had not come. She was returned to her body, and she survived. The experience changed her in a lot of ways, but one way in particular. She became clairvoyant. Well, about a month after I had my near-death experience, I was driving home from work to visit a friend. We were going to have supper together. And suddenly, I got a very clear visual image in my head of my, my friend's brain covered in pus. Now, this image to me as a doctor was a very clear visual image of meningitis. So when I got there, I asked my friend Susan, how are you, how are you feeling? And she said to me, gee, Vaughn, I've got a really, really bad headache. I've never had a headache like this. This is one of the worst migraines I ever had. 
as a doctor, I asked her all the other symptoms of meningitis, and she didn't have any of them. So I said to her, listen, if you develop any of the other symptoms of meningitis, I want you to promise me that you go to the emergency tonight at the hospital and insist on being tested for meningitis. So as it turns out, she did get worse that night. She did go to the emergency of a major hospital here in Toronto. And sure enough, she was confirmed at being at the very early stages of a very rare and often fatal type of meningitis. And because it was diagnosed so early, she survived it without any brain damage, which is very rare for an adult. So uh, this was my first clairvoyant episode. Dr. Kaysan's experience is not unusual in itself. Claims of increased physical sensitivity and mental powers are frequent and controversial after effects of the near-death experience. But remember this, the people we met are representative of literally hundreds of thousands who report similar experiences. They can't all be wrong. Something has happened to these people, and it has to do with the questions we asked earlier. Is the near-death experience indeed confined to the brain only? Or is it the result of non-physical phenomena of the spirit? I came down and said goodbye to him at 6.25. I remember it distinctly, and he was the happiest kid on earth because he was going to do what he loved to do. And, uh, you know, it was the last moments I saw him alive. 19-year-old Stephen Savin was a bright, active, seemingly healthy kid, a kind of golden boy. And then one morning, in a phys ed class, his heart just quit. pronounced dead in a hospital before either his frantic parents could get there. Their shock was crushing and total. I, I had never felt so much hurt in all my life and it's, it's a hurt that you just can't take away. It was almost as if um, this great big hole was suddenly inside of you. Um, and no matter what, it just wouldn't go away. Before I, I had gone to bed that night, I was the last one to sort of put all the lights out and go upstairs. And, and it was a time for me to be with my own feelings. Um, we'd had a house full of people all day and um, it was my time and um, I just started to talk to Stephen. It was something that I felt that would help me. And I had asked him if there was any way in the world that he could come and say goodbye because I had not been able to say goodbye to him. And I felt that his father really needed something at this time. With that note, I went to bed and I went to sleep really quickly because I was exhausted and then you know, I woke up around three o'clock you know found that I, I got out of bed it was around 2 30 in the morning it was quite uh, quiet out and I remember coming downstairs and doing a lot of thinking and uh, looking at pictures of Stephen and just generally uh, trying to get a handle on what was going on and then I came back upstairs and uh, Linda was in bed, and I got in bed with her, and no, she was awake. Too. And we were lying there, and it was it was around three, really three ten time. in the morning, and it was very quiet and, and peaceful. I miss him. Then all of a sudden, I, I I felt something, and I I put my hand over my oh, eyes, God. and I had my so eyes wide open. What? And I felt, oh, and then I God. saw a light. I, think I said to Linda, there's something happening. What does it look like? And she, she said, what was it? And I, I like said, I don't know, but there's just something here. And I, and I saw the light, and I, I knew it was Steve. And uh, I don't know how I knew, but uh, Linda was saying, what, what's he look like? I said, he, he's, he's a dove, and, and he's a star. 
and 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 he's neither one at the same time. He's 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 in and out, and he and the, he was pulsing with energy and bright bright light and very distinct and real. And and Linda said, "What's he saying?" And I said, "He's not saying anything. He's just there in front of me." And um, I was just transfixed looking at him, and, and uh, it was beautiful. And I I knew it was our son. And uh, all of a sudden, I heard the words, thank you. It came through me. And I knew that uh, Stephen had said goodbye to us. It was the most amazing experience I've ever had in my life. I felt a definite, sudden calm come all over me. This story was one that Tom Harper, theologian, Rhodes Scholar, journalist, and author, encountered when he had finished writing his bestseller, Life After Death. The experience of the Savins is both touching and extraordinarily vivid. But perhaps more importantly, I find it completely believable. Neither of them had had any contact with the paranormal before this occurrence. And while it would be wrong to say that they miss Stephen any less now, there's no question that this incident has allowed them to begin to come to terms with his death. An important point to remember when we listen to stories such as those of the Savins is the sheer number of people who report such experiences. The Savins, in fact, are two of literally millions. Bill Guggenheim is a former Wall Street securities analyst who has now become a noted researcher in after-death communications. Well, if these are very common events, we estimate as an example that 20% of all Americans and Canadians have had an after-death communication experience which translates into numbers such as 50 million Americans or 5 million Canadians. And that, those are very conservative estimates. Yeah, numbers are probably closer to double those figures. And yet people don't talk about these because when they have them, they often think they're going crazy or losing their mind, especially if they're bereaved at that time. So if they go to share them with somebody else, there's a great deal of skepticism in our Western culture about after-death communications. And yet the irony is that these are very, very common in other parts of the world, such as the Catholic countries of Central America, South America, parts of Europe, you know, in the Middle East, and even the Far East. There, there would be no reason to do the research or to write a book about the subject because they're just part of the process of, of living and of grieving and of dying and communicating after death back to the living person. Marilyn Johnson comes from a long line of native North American shaman and has inherited the gift of soul travel from her late grandfather. The story she is about to tell may give you pause, but the tradition of soul traveling she refers to is practiced by native people and is a process by which she leaves her body in spirit form. My primary purpose in life is to soul travel, gather information in the physical world and travel to the land of the dead and obtain information from people's ancestors and then bring the information back and then help people here. So it's sort of compiling information from two different places and then presenting it as a package of information to those who are still living here. Marilyn Johnson helps those in the land of the living gain information about themselves through contact with those in the land of the dead. But she can also use this gift to heal those in the land of the dead. So about in 1981, uh, there was myself and a few other medicine people here in Toronto received a phone call from a woman in New Mexico. And her and her partner at that time told us that their house was haunted and uh, described a lot of noises and they could hear like a little girl crying late at night sometimes and they checked around the house and there was nobody there. So one evening they were out for a walk and it was at sunset and they were just coming home and they saw a little girl in a long dress in the front window of their house. And they were wondering who was this little girl and why is she by herself? She looked like she was about uh, five years old and maybe of native ancestry. She had black hair and dark skin. Little girl! Hey! And she turned around when they called her and she just looked at them and smiled and then she walked along the front of the house and she went about maybe 10 feet and then 
disappeared right into the house through the wall. So at that point, they knew that she wasn't living in this existence, that she had, she was a spirit of some sort. So they were really um, excited by this and also very uh, afraid because they just didn't know what to do about it. And they walked closer to the house and looked at the window and they could see the handprints, of a child's handprints on the window. So I went uh, soul traveling over four nights, like I usually do, and uh, spoke to the spirit of this little girl. But also, her, the spirit of her mother showed up, and I could see that they were separated. And what had happened is that coming over the knoll of a hill right near where that house is located now. And uh, the mother fell down the hill and um, broke her neck. And then the little girl stayed with her mother and then eventually just died of exposure and starvation. And because they had died at separate times, it's like they were spiritually separated. Coming back to the house, looking for her mother, because it, it, all, it had all occurred in that location. Um, so I, I relayed this message back to them. And in the meantime, they'd also sent me a photograph of these handprints. So what we advised them to do, and we did as well here, is we had a feast for the two of them so that their spirits could be uh, joined together in the same location in the spirit world. And we wanted them to be together. And once this was done, then the house wasn't haunted anymore. As the Savins and Marilyn Johnson show, there's no lack of evidence about contact with the beyond. But in the Western world, the world of mainstream science and religion and good old hard-headed common sense, the first tendency is always to scoff at such stories, and particularly if you're a scientist. I think death is the most profound blow that a person can face. It's a frightening experience, the end of myself or of a loved one. And uh, people want to deny it, so there's a tremendous denial of death. And so there is what I call the transcendental temptation, the yearning of the soul to leap beyond and to communicate with the dead. But again, these are anecdotal reports, they're psychological or subjective accounts. And the question is, people may have thought they saw this, but were they, were they really, are these experiences veridical, are they true, or are they merely describing their own internal psychological needs? I think the latter is probably the better explanation. Not all scientists take his heart a line. Dr. Richard Olson at the University of North Carolina led a team of researchers who conducted a study with widows and widowers after the death of their spouses. And well over half, uh, about 60 some percent, uh, said that they'd experienced the uh, spouse in some way. Some had a sense of presence, some actually uh, spoke with their spouse, some saw them, uh, some felt a physical presence. Uh, none had discussed it with their physician. Uh, very few had mentioned it to their family. I think one of the interesting features we've found is that during conditions of death, specifically to significant others, such as husbands and wives and children, uh, effectively anyone with whom there is bonding, emotional bonding, interior cingulate type bonding, during these conditions, uh, individuals can often, particularly during dream states, particularly during altered states, can experience information at a distance. And we now realize it has something to do with the right hemisphere and the way the right hemisphere can uh, detect information spatially and how it can respond to emotions. And again, it has to do with bonding. It only seems to work with individuals with whom there's a great deal of emotional bonding. 
While scientists like Dr. Persinger explore the communication that occurs between those at the point of death and their loved ones, they still tend not to acknowledge the possibility that the soul continues beyond death. That assumption lies at the heart of parapsychologist Boyce Beatty's work. I live in Connecticut, and when persons call Yale University or the University of Connecticut and say they have a ghost in their house, they're frightened, they don't know with whom to speak, they're put in contact with me, and then I work with others, usually a deep trance medium or a clairvoyant, and sometimes a clinical psychologist and maybe another parapsychologist. We investigate and we eliminate viable alternative explanations. Are the person somehow disturbed psychologically? Is it squirrels in the attic? And if we cannot find a normal explanation for it and, and do find in fact that it is a, a spirit of a deceased human being, then we conduct what is called rescue mediumship, counseling the dead or soul rescue work, speaking to them, communicating with them, helping them understand they're not in a physical body any longer and then helping them pass on into the afterlife. For most people, even those who accept some form of life after death, these assertions can be a little hard to swallow. But Boyce Beatty asks us to approach what he calls rescue mediumship from the other direction, from the results it gets, the many people from whose lives he claims to have removed inexplicable disruptions, people such as Bill and Laurie McCauley, I said to Lori, it's coming back after me. Whatever this is, it's coming back after me again. And I, I was petrified. Just sweat was just pouring off of me. And all of a sudden, I felt something on my back. Not physically on my back, but I knew something was on me. We moved in the house in 1985. And shortly after that, um, things would happen sporadically in the house. Lights would come on and off um, with an unexplained nature. We'd hear uh, voices in our house other than our own, um, children laughing and crying other than our own. Um, objects would move before our eyes. Um, and this was very sporadic. Um, nothing that um, really pointed out to us that uh, definitely our house was haunted. I kept pushing these things to the back of my mind, no, this couldn't be happening, this couldn't be happening, it's got to be of a human nature, it's got to be um, a neighborhood child or a neighborhood teenager or, or somebody was harassing my wife. Until one evening I was working second shift and I had come home from work and everybody was asleep. And I took the dog out in the backyard and all of a sudden this light came out of the ground. It was about six feet long by about three feet wide. It just came right out of the grass and my dog walked over to the edge of it and showed his teeth and started growling ferociously at it. So I grabbed the dog and we went back in the house. And as I locked up the house, my son started having a nightmare, one of many nightmares um, upstairs in his bedroom. So I woke him up and brought him downstairs and, and put him into my wife's, into, into our bed. So I went upstairs, undressed, and I got into Jeffrey's bed. And then as I lay down, I felt a presence for the very first time um, over the dresser, looking down at me. And I sat up. It's black, you know, the room is dark, but I knew something was there looking at me, and the only thing I could feel, I was not so much frightened as I felt as though it was confused. It was trying to figure out why was I in, in this bed and not Jeffrey. At first he was my friend in the beginning, but then at the end I was listening to my parents a lot, and he'd try and scare me until one night he was really bugging me and a lot of havoc was going on. We were sleeping together in the same bed. And there was that one occurrence when he came out of the closet and was scaring us, and he just pulled the covers off us, and he was just scaring my brother and me. And that's when I concluded for the very first time that there was a haunting or a ghost or some type of entity in our home um, affecting my family. Upon reading an article about Boyce Beatty in the newspaper The Hartford Current, 
Bill McCauley contacted him. Boyce determined that the family was indeed troubled by a legitimate haunting before prescribing a remedy. What finally worked in our case was um, the mild exorcism in the home and uh, Boyce Beatty did a prayer for the dead which um, uh, helped pass over the earthbound spirits that were left f in our home. Recognizing that in many of these cases it's a matter of helping people go into the light uh, recognizing that in many of these kind of cases what is happening is that it is the spirit of a deceased human being who is earthbound who is quite confused not realizing they are no longer functioning in a physical human body and uh, have not passed into the afterlife into the light so that night I uh, did a, a prayer that um, was oriented toward communicating with the spirits of any deceased uh, human beings who had not gone into the light, who were earthbound. As a result of their experience, the Macaulays have pioneered a self-help group, Victims of Paranormal Phenomena. Some Buddhists believe that if we don't get to the light after we die, we will remain sorrowfully earthbound, unable to find our way through the bardo and into our next reincarnation. Other cultures maintain similar concepts expressed in their own terms. The testimony of the Savins, Marilyn Johnson, and the Macaulays points to the possibility that consciousness can have existence beyond physical death. They thought Jessie Lott had a bad cold until her liver began to fail. She went into a coma her brain pressure reached 100, and her heart stopped. For 20 minutes, she was gone. And then, she came back. An ordinary emergency, really. Except for one thing. When my heart stopped, I just suddenly found the grandma, and she passed away like a year ago. Uh-huh, uh-huh. What did she look like? Well, she was pretty much like a white robot, and she looked exactly how she did before she died. I have interviewed dozens and dozens and dozens of children who have had these experiences. It is Pediatrician Dr. Melvin Morse of the Seattle Children's Hospital has conducted by far the most in-depth research into children's near-death experiences. His documentation includes extensive on-camera interviews with children, such as Jesse Lott. And what did you think about that, your grandma being there? I was just so shocked that in, you know, I don't know, just, like, she was right there, and I was right here, and I can't move. She was just sitting there, it's like she's frozen. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I was sort of scared, but it wasn't happy to see her. That's all I remember. So she's sitting in a chair, she's sitting frozen, and she was gone. I, I don't know where I went, but I went somewhere. She's just a kid. A kid with no axe to grind. No knowledge of the concept of the near-death experience. In her case, hardly any religion in her upbringing at all. Just a kid who remembers what she experienced. Hers is just one of the stories Tom Harper, Rhodes scholar, theologian, and journalist, encountered when he was researching his bestseller, Life After Death. Just a kid. But to children, and particularly those who have had no special indoctrination in religious ideas, have something unique to tell us about what happens after death. Are their experiences different? Or do they have the same experiences as adults, but see them differently? Are they better reporters because of their lack of sophistication? In this program, we will look at many examples of children's testimony. Children have simple and pure experiences. They use words like neat or weird, <laughs> which you know are very, <laughs> very real feelings. That uh, uh, you know the typical child's near-death experience. They go, "Wow, I thought I was floating out of my body, and, and I knew I was dead, but I was still alive." And, and there's a a genuine quality of mystery about it. How could such a thing be really happening to them? They're often frightened by the experience. Many of them wonder how they're going to get back in their body. Uh, since it's so far out of the realm of anything they expected, uh, they uh, frequently say, it was scary. 
Uh, that's not an unusual uh, experience at all. And mostly I'm impressed by how fragmentary the experiences are. They usually just tell a teeny little fragment of something that has clearly uh, struck them. Because the huge noodle was just like a tunnel. It went straight and it didn't have anything in your way. It wasn't like a a horrendous crash on a snowy mountain bridge plunged three-year-old Chris Eggleston into a freezing lake. Was that scary? Yeah. And our mom yelled to take our seatbelts off. But when we crashed, behind us was a car with six children in it. He was the person who saved my life. He saw us go around the curve, but when he came around the curve, he didn't see a thing. So he took his flashlight and went down off the bridge, and he could see us, could see our car. So he had to dive like five or six times to get down far enough to get to me. And during all that time, I was having a near death experience. Chris Eggleston had, again, a typical child's near-death experience in the sense that it's brief, fragmentary, difficult to comprehend uh, uh, both for us uh, and uh, for him. I started falling through this new coming closer and closer. And I went and tied it and tied it and it was all like a rainbow. And then at the end, there was a wall with smaller, just two smaller tunnels that would lead to like an animal having their home. And he was in a car, uh, which filled up with water, and he nearly drowned. He said suddenly everything went blank. He was then out of his body, surprised to be there. <laughs> felt that eventually he could learn to swim or, or, or somehow move himself uh, in the air, uh, said that he went to a place that he called the human heaven and made some sort of choice to return uh, to uh, his body. But uh, interestingly enough, he says uh, that he was in a huge noodle until he realized uh, that noodles don't have rainbows in them, so it must have been some sort of tunnel. Children's experiences have the common features of tunnels, lights, out-of-body experiences, all of which I think we can understand in, in brain terms. What they don't have is elaborated visions of the kind that adults have. They do not have long life reviews, that they haven't had a long life. Um, quite often they see living people as well as dead ones. They see their pets, they see the people who matter to them in a different way from adults. We also mustn't forget that many children, particularly in America where most of these stories come from, are exposed to a lot of religious propaganda early in their life. They hear about heaven and hell and pearly gates and angels and so on. And in fact, some of the angels' children report are classic sort of painted angels that you might get in a religious shop, wings and halos and, and the whole works. So I think a lot of the details come from children's expectations, just as they do with adults. And then I didn't know which was which, so I started floating down the then I ran into this humongous flower, and then inside I found a honeybee bee that was like as big as I was now. I knew he liked me because he gave me some bread. His parents had no religious beliefs whatsoever. He doesn't encounter something that he thought uh, was God. Uh, his heaven uh, is a very commonplace description of heaven in that it was a golden castle with pearly gates, uh, the kind of thing uh, that I think virtually every child is exposed to. Um, he says he had a bumblebee as a helper uh, that assisted him uh, with the experience. In other words, uh, I think a more religious child typically describes guardian angels as assisting them with the experience. 
Um, in his case, it was a bumblebee, a very non-religious uh, image in keeping with his very non-religious background. The one message I've learned from children's near-death experiences is that we die the life we live. So, it seems we die the life we live. The same images that are comforting to you in life are comforting in death. How did that make you feel? It, I was sort of scared, but sort of happy to see her. You were happy to see her? Uh-huh. And then what happened? One of the most interesting things about watching the interview with Jesse Lott is the fragmentary nature of her experience. She's obviously struggling with something very profound that's happened to her, and yet she herself doesn't understand it. She has a long memory gap to the very moment her heart stopped beating. And that's when she had the image that her grandmother was sitting there at the bedside. I was just so shocked to see her. She has the sensation she went somewhere else, and then she was back. And then following this tiny little memory, which is localized to the point of her near death, she then has another long memory gap. She doesn't tell us a coherent story. She doesn't fill in every memory gap. She doesn't have a logical or rational explanation for the puzzling things that happened to her. Instead, she simply tells us what she saw and how profoundly affected she was by it. I think it's fair to say that children identify more with natural phenomena than adults do. Where, for example, an adult might typically see religious symbols during a near-death experience, children very frequently encounter animals. Chris Eggleston's honeybee, for example. In addition, children themselves are often identified with small creatures, such as the monarch butterfly, in the following story. The monarch is an ancient symbol for early death probably because its metamorphoses can be seen as symbolic transitions to another life. But here's a man for whom the symbol became real. My daughter's computer name was, was Panda, and she would get on the computer and communicate with friends. And so uh, even before she died, one of my head covers in golf was a Panda. And so I'd always think of Jenny when, when uh, I played golf and would take that cover off. The first monarch experience for me was a Sunday afternoon in August and beautiful in Omaha and uh, gathered my three wood out in the fairway and the head cover was the panda thinking about Jenny and looked down to my ball and there's a monarch sitting on the ball. And that monarch just sat there and I said, there, there's, there's no way I'm, I'm going to hit that ball. So after several minutes, finally the monarch very gently and kind of spiraled up and went away, and and I felt very warm about it. Told my wife, and and uh, within a couple of weeks, some more began to happen. I was talking to a new next-door neighbor, and he asked me, how many children do you have? And I'm always reluctant, do I say three, including Jenny, or two, just the living? And I said three. And so he asked me questions. He says, I know a little bit about that and, and uh, what happened. So I told him, and then I began to relate the butterfly stories, uh, three of which had already happened at that point. I take my hat off, and I'm shushing it away. Thing just doesn't want to go away. And as I'm talking about Jenny, as I'm talking about deathbed visions and so on, a monarch comes and there's a twig there and sits there. And he's doing this double take looking at me and looking at the monarch. And it sits there what seems like uh, six to seven minutes. And so for me, I don't know what they prove or whatever other than I take them for what they are and that, that somehow my daughter is still in my life. Somehow his daughter is still in his life. But in what sense? Is she in some way present in the butterfly? Or do we really mean in his memory? Does this have something to teach us about what happens after death? 
Certainly many parents think so, and then there are the students and the researchers in the field of children and dying who frequently encounter stories of deceased children who come back to help their loved ones. I interviewed a man who had a little girl who had spent 18 months dying of neuroblastoma, and she got through multiple remissions. How was your day? Okay. Did anybody come to visit? No. No? Can I get you anything? No. Dad? Yeah? No, I've saved myself One day, three times. she and her father were talking, and she was very concerned about what was going to happen. And she said, Daddy, do you know why I've got better three times? He said, no, honey, why? She said, because I have to prepare you for my death. And when I feel you're ready, then I'll die. And the day she died, she put her arms around her daddy's neck and said, Daddy, you've got to promise you won't do anything to hurt yourself. And he promised. But yet the pain and the anguish so great. Three days later, he was seriously thinking of killing himself. But uh, he heard her distinctly say, Daddy, remember, you promised. And he said, even though the pain was bad after that, I never seriously contemplated committing suicide again. A hallucination? Maybe. But when people die, there's always an inexplicable aura around them, and never is that phenomenon more deeply felt than when a child dies. The feeling may come from the child, but it encompasses all the people close at hand. There's no end of credible anecdotal evidence to this effect. But Emily Dickinson puts it as clearly as anyone ever has. The last night that she lived, it was a common night, except the dying. This to us made nature different. We noticed smallest things, things overlooked before, by this great light upon our minds, italicized, as it were. You know, something that Dr. Morse has learned from his research is that children don't see death as something to be feared. I'm curious, one child said to me, I'm not afraid to die anymore. What's the message that people who've had these experiences, that they tell us again and again, I'm no longer afraid to die. Sometimes children carry their indifference to death to extremes, appearing notoriously casual, not to say callous about the whole idea, after all. They can't really conceive of its meaning, and certainly not to its happening to them. Miss Lucy had a baby, she named it Tiny Tim. She put it in the bathtub to see if it could swim. It drank up all the water, it ate up all the soap. It died the very next morning with bottles in its throat. Miss Lucy had a baby, she named it Tiny Tim. She put it in the bathtub to see if it could swim. It drank up all the water, it ate up all the soap. It tried to eat the bathtub, but it wouldn't go down so Miss Lucy had a baby. <laughs> But children not only have near-death experiences, they die too. And there's plenty of evidence that they tend to approach their deaths differently than adults. They are often less frightened and more concerned with the effects on their loved ones. Tanya Carwana had been battling leukemia for close to three years when her parents had to break the news to her that she wasn't going to get any better. When her cancer did come back, it was, it was, it was really, it was devastating. And that to think that your child is, is going to die and you're never going to see that child again. Tanya became very quiet, very withdrawn at that point. I knew that I couldn't wait any longer, that I had to confirm to her that yes, there's nothing more that could be done. And that was a very difficult thing as a mother to do, to look here. 13 year old child in the face and tell them that there's nothing more that can be done for them. Shortly afterwards, um, I went down to take a break and have a really good cry for myself. And when I came back up, she wasn't in her room. And I found her in a little five year old boy's room telling him how important it is that he takes his medication because he was having a lot of problems taking his medication. 
and I thought here's this child that just found out that she's dying and here she is trying to help somebody else. When children are dying of an illness, it's a devastating event for parents, obviously, and siblings. But if the parent can make themselves receptive to the child really truly sharing their experience, rather than continue to be rooted in the physical losses and changes, and that's a very hard thing to do. Ante anticipating the loss of a child is it's one of life's most devastating things. But you have this little child, this little, this little spirit, that is having some very wonderful experiences. She was very weak and you could see her just trying to lift her arms and at first we couldn't figure out what she was trying to do and then we realized through her whispers that she was trying to hug us. So we both took an arm, my husband took an arm and I took on an arm and I was laying on the bed beside her and I put my other arm around her and I was just holding her and she kept saying over and over again, I love you, I love you. She knew that her time had come. If the parents can be more receptive to where the child truly is, not so much where the child's body is, it's a big distinction, they will get some very comforting messages that this child is not alone, this child is going on a wonderful adventure, this child is not afraid, this child is not suffering. These are all things that will give them tremendous grief uh, assistance in, in, the, in the journey that they have up ahead. A tremendous amount of peace. Actually, the, the 10 minutes before she was dying, at the, at the very end, her breaths got quieter and quieter, and she stopped breathing. And at that point, I started crying. And she started breathing again. It was like she was trying to make herself go on for my sake. And I told her, I said, no, Tanya, no, it's okay, it's okay. And at that point, she stopped breathing. And then that was it for her. Tanya's love for her family and her lack of fear in the face of her impending death taught everyone around her a profound lesson in courage. The stories of children who have had near-death experiences and what those who were close to children who have died tell us confirms to me my sense that they're nearer to the womb of creation. And perhaps, in some sense, they're privy to a clearer and purer perception of what's happening to them. As Maggie Callanan tells us, if we can get beyond the grief and the pain we feel as a child close to us is dying, we might hear them telling us something very important about the journey they see ahead, that it's an adventure, that they're not afraid, and that we shouldn't be either. This was dreamt by a dying woman in her hospital room. A lit candle suddenly appears on her windowsill. out. A terrifying, suffocating, miasmic blackness envelops everything. Then, the candle relights, but on the other side of the closed window. The woman died shortly after relating the dream we've just seen to a nurse. Tom Harper, theologian, Rhodes Scholar, journalist and author, encountered this story when he was researching his best-selling book, Life After Death. Well, what are we to make of it? What did the dream mean? It must have been significant because, after all, this was the last dream she ever had the final manifestation of her unconscious mind in this world. According to the celebrated psychiatrist and dream analyst, Dr. Marie-Louise von Franz, and based upon her analysis of over 10,000 dreams of the dying, the meaning being communicated is that the light of the individual, one of those common metaphors for life that we've seen so often, 
goes out at death but is miraculously renewed on the other side. In other words, the spirit seems to live on. This dream, then, illustrates perfectly a profound insight of the great psychoanalyst and the mentor of Dr. von Franz, Carl Jung. The unconscious psyche believes in a life after death. According to Jung, dream symbols which exist in the very depths of the soul behave as if the psychic life of the individual will continue. In Dr. von Franz's words, these symbols depict the end of bodily life and the explicit continuation of psychic life after death. In other words, our last dreams prepare us for death and possibly a life beyond death. You know, it's not only adults who have experienced preparation dreams. Children have reported them too. Here's a particularly telling example. And what's especially interesting and moving is the clarity with which a little boy sees an impending life on the other side. Corey Beller had cancer. Kimberly Clark Sharp spoke to him and to his mother Shirley about his dreams in which he traveled to a heavenly place called Summerland. Corey even painted a picture of Summerland. He would cross a rainbow bridge in each dream and go to a place that was so pleasant and wonderful that he called it Summerland. And there was a crystal castle there. And increasingly, there were other children there that he knew from his cancer treatment. He loved Summerland, and he spent more and more time in these dreams going there until he felt like his family was in an emotional position to accept his decision to go to Summerland permanently. And with a great deal of matter-of-factness, he announced this to his physicians, and this was at Children's Hospital here in Seattle. His physicians supported his no-treatment decision. He had already had seven rounds of chemotherapy during, of like months-long chemotherapy. This little kid had suffered beyond endurance. Um, and he didn't want any more. He wanted to go to Summerland. So he said, hey, docs, I'm ready to die. I'm not going to have any more treatment. They said, okay. Send him home. And he died in his mother's arms on Mother's Day. Because he had central nervous system disease in his brain and in the lining and the fluid around his brain, he um, had a lot of sort of flailing and kind of spastic movements. But he did this Lamaze-type breathing all the way through, and he was, he was coherent the entire time and kept trying to have conversations with my friend Shirley who was with us and I and and she she was as fascinated I think as I was and we neither one of us had ever been with anybody who was dying you know going through that whole dying process and um, he had no fear absolutely none he saw Summerland as a real place, not as a dream or a vision. To him, it was, it was a, a real destination, and one where he knew that everybody who dies would go there at some point, and that um, that's where he would be reunited with us someday when we die. Corey Beller showed us that dying children dream in a pure and often unexamined context. But dying adults often look for meaning in the dreams of their final days. Do these dreams provide an insight into what awaits them after death? This is Casey House, a hospice for terminally ill AIDS patients in Toronto, Canada. It is probable that every patient here will have died long before this program is seen. That is no secret, least of all from their own unconscious minds. Yves Benoit, a 37-year-old playwright and artist, talked to us about his dreams and how he interpreted them. The universe is the sea. The sea represents... I have dreams about the sea. Or in Manitoba with the endless field. Or those mountain that are so huge, you know, and so beautiful, or uh, the 
Cape Breton with, with the, the, the waves of water coming, you know, and crashing again. Dying is to be part again of the universe without having to compromise or without having to work for it, <laughs> you know? There is this, this sense that they have the power to make your life change like that, you know? But when you die, there's, it's like the, the elements become your friends or they have seduced you. Anyway, I don't know if they are your, your friends or your enemies, but the one thing for sure, you're going back to them. It's, uh... Eve rejoined the elements in his dreams two weeks after he spoke with us. Douglas Graydon, the chaplain at Casey House, has seen a great many like Eve and listened to them describe their dreams. I think it's taught me that the dying process is a lot more gentle than I presumed it to be. Um, I know there's an awful lot of debate as to whether or not the human body physiologically is releasing hormones or other forms of um, substances within itself to deaden the pain of approaching death. I'm, I'm uncertain as to whether I, I buy into that totally, if I can phrase it that way. But it's taught me that the dying process can be a very gentle one, can be a very welcoming one, cannot be um, a frightening process for people. Um, and that it's also something that generally people who are watching the death, if they're listening to the dreams well enough, there's the challenge. Um, that we don't need to be frightened by the death that we're witnessing either. Um, the dreams that I listen to are dreams that tell me that death can be a very reassuring process. The, the question, the question may make me laugh. If I, if I believe in life after death, it's... Uh, of course I believe in life after death. Like I believe in the wind and I believe in the sun. Of course I believe in life after death. Bruce Bynum, an American researcher, has spent much of his professional life studying the many aspects of dream life, including what happens as death approaches. Most cultures have a, uh, a very rich and diverse way of uh, indicating that death is on its way. Death is uh, inescapable. Nothing can live that will not eventually turn to death. So. Uh, one's religion and one's culture, one's personal experience profoundly influences the exact content of the symbolism. The symbolization process is a universal process, but the contents of the symbols are different. If you are a Roman Catholic, you may have a certain series of symbols or images come to you. If you are a Buddhist, you may have a different set of symbols and images come to you. If you are uh, Hindu, if you are Islamic or whatever, but the symbolization process and the psyches attempt to come to terms with it, that's a pretty universal, pretty universal phenomenon. And again, the body and the mind begin to not go their separate ways, but the psyche begins to separate somewhat from the physical body and, they, and turn its attention toward the deeper regions of its own soul, its own psyche, if you will. There are definite common symbols, particularly in the West, about the, uh, one's own death. Uh, common ones are one about to take a long trip, a long journey. Uh, another common one is uh, the uh, one's final curtain call, if you will. Another one is uh, images of burial grounds. So there are many, many, many very common ones, and you could call them archetypal if you want, but they're very common. You would find a different set of ones if you were in India and a different set of ones if you were in Japan. So culture influences profoundly the content of symbols, but the symbolization process is universal. 
Sometimes the symbol of impending death can be entirely personal, perhaps only a sound. I heard a fly buzz when I died. The stillness in the room was like the stillness in the air between the heaves of storm. With blue, uncertain, stumbling buzz between the light and me. And then the windows failed. And then I could not see to see. But whether the symbols are traditional or personal, the basic question arises, is this real information in symbolic form? Are we truly being informed about what to expect? Maggie Callanan is a palliative care nurse and co-founder of Shades of the Rainbow, a workshop whose aim it is to reframe our approach to dying. We really use dreams uh, in two pretty distinct ways in hospice. First of all, I think it's, a, it's an important type of communication if our patients are dreaming to ask them to talk about the dream. If dreams uh, recur, if there's a pattern to their recurrence, the same dream over and over again. Um, some dreams may have a theme that builds. I remember one woman who lived very much alone and uh, her cat was her real important person or the, the thing that she loved most in life and uh, the cat, she had had the cat put to sleep just some uh, weeks prior to her own death. And in her dream, she could see the cat down the tunnel, and she would squint and look, and she wasn't sure about the shape, and, and the dreams were sequential, and as time went by, they, then she was sure it was the cat, and it was coming closer and closer and closer. And I remember saying to the nurses, she will probably die when that cat comes. <laughs> volunteer sitting with her so that she wouldn't be alone and the volunteer came out and said look she's waving but she was going like this and she was stroking the cat so that was a good tip off to us that this there was this process going on with her a cat a fly a stopped clock another person anything and anyone appearing in a dream can be the bearer of the ultimate tidings. Uh, the experience I've had with people actually who have, who have dreamt about their impending deaths predates my involvement with near-death experiences. First time that I can remember anyway encountering this phenomena was uh, an old gent who was on the medical intensive care unit at Harborview who had a dream that he was going to die at around 2 p.m. that Sunday afternoon. This was on a Friday. Jim. And in his dream, his brother, who was deceased, had come to tell him this. Two o'clock on Sunday, you're going to be with me. Two o'clock on Sunday, you're going to be with me. So he asked if I would please come to say goodbye to him Sunday morning. Well, you know, so sure, I was going to come in only to assure him that he wasn't going to die. He, in fact, spent that interim time getting better, getting better, getting better. Jim. Jim. Code blue, 104. And that Sunday, around 2 o'clock, he went into cardiac arrest and nobody could get him out. Nobody. And he died. And I was comforted by the fact that I knew his brother had come for him again. Sunday, you're going to be with me. Over the years, Maggie Callanan has come as close to understanding the process of dying as anyone could. Some of her conclusions may surprise you, especially her sense of how dying people organize their deaths, for want of a better word. 
the way I describe it to my families is it's almost like your dying father has a foot in two worlds and he has the ability to shift back and forth between the two worlds. When I worked in the hospitals, I was never surprised to hear somebody seriously ill say, I want to go home, I want to go home. That made sense to me. But wasn't I surprised when I started working in patients' homes that patients were saying, I want to go home. Then you have to say, wait a minute, what are we talking about here? And patients saying very clearly to my families, I have to go home now. It's time for me to go. A lot of this kind of symbolic language about taking a trip, um, uh, seeing a place that no one else can see, um, being aware of people that no one else can see, oftentimes dead relatives, uh, people who have predeceased the person, or sometimes a spiritual being. Um, dying patients frequently know exactly when they're going to die, even if no one has told them that they're dying. Now, they cannot stop the process, but they can delay or speed the process up when all around them is in the right place. Uh, most people are aware that a grandmother can wait until her favorite gran grandson travels across the country to say goodbye. But what people overlook is the dying person who sends the family away, perhaps in a hospital, go home and rest, you're tired, I'm doing better. And the family gets home and a half an hour later the nurse calls and says he's gone. That family is left with a legacy of guilt that is destructive and, and wounding. When in fact it was the last loving act that he actually chose to spare the people he cared the most about. Um, dying children very prevalently send their parents away. It's almost as though the pain of having them present when they die is too much. That they can't be freed to go on to this journey that they really want to go on to when they see the pain of loss in their parents' faces. Um, this is very important for people to know ahead of time. Because otherwise they carry a legacy of guilt with them for years. How could I have gone asleep? How could I have left? How could I have had dinner in the cafeteria? And they feel terrible anguish over that. The really important point about dreams that struck me as I was researching this particular aspect of evidence for life after death was that the unconscious, using archetypal images, encounters very squarely the fact that the body is facing its own dissolution, that death is real. At the same time, the psyche also seems to be telling us with very rich and universal imagery that it has a deep-seated belief that life or consciousness somehow goes on at the end. I found this even more telling than the evidence of the near-death experience. In our culture, dreams may be the best medium to inform us about the journey we might undertake. In others, as Bruce Bynum now explains, meditation and contemplation are the keys to furthering this process of understanding. Most other cultures have a very rich, diverse history of working with people who are dying. In the West African traditions, uh, sometimes ceremonies are held. In the uh, Hindu tradition, one turns away from the external life and focuses more, much more internally. Most cultures have a tradition of this. The only cultures in the, in the world who don't have a tradition of this, unfortunately, are the West. And we've sort of um, lost a little bit of our way in that area while pursuing other things. We've sort of lost the art of dying. And the art of dying is complementary to the art of living. Both are involved with transformation. Both are involved with wisdom. There's a lot to be learned in the process of dying. You don't want to sleep through your own death. It's hard to, to get people to believe that it wasn't a, a suicide attempt. Pat Young I, I was in that despair that, that she would ever be able to resolve the difficulties in her marriage. And so she shot herself and went to hell. I knew it had to be something that would be drastic enough to put me in the hospital, but not drastic enough to kill me. So I didn't do, do my torso because I didn't want to do any serious damage. So I thought if it went in one side of my neck and out the other side, that would be bad enough to put me there. Not bad enough to keep me there. I had no idea I would die. I, I was in a coma for three days on life support. They, they, didn't, they, they were positive I wasn't going to live. They had informed the family that um, they had lost too much blood. It started out with these little beings, um, child-sized creatures, grotesque, absolutely grotesque little creatures. And um, they took great delight in um, doing things. They would make holes in me. They would either shoot me or 
they would make holes by actually hitting me. And um, in these holes, they would put horrible things. Any, anything that was, that was excrement, um, vomit, um, bile, anything that was absolutely obnoxious. And these holes were everywhere. They would put them in my body, in my arm, um, in my cheek, in my eye socket. And, and you, you can't do anything. And, and you're extremely ill from it. But, but you can't get sick. I wasn't able to, to even gag. And, and you can't feel the pain, but you can feel and, but, and you can smell. And just beyond my right shoulder, I could hear this um, very heavy, raspy breathing. And it was getting closer. And I, I couldn't turn to see, and I didn't want to see. But I knew that as soon as it got within my range of view, that what I had gone through up till then was absolutely nothing. It was absolute pure evil of some sort that was coming. And at the very last second, when I knew the very next instant it would be within my range of view, I opened my eyes and I was alive. Tom Harper, Rhodes Scholar, theologian, and journalist, found when he was researching his book, Life After Death, that most people who have undergone near-death experiences claim to have at least started on the path to heaven. But there are others for whom the experience turned intensely negative. Hellish, in other words. Not long ago, my wife and I attended a church service in which the preacher declared in no uncertain terms that only those born again in Jesus would be spared eternal damnation. Afterwards, I told him I thought he had a rather narrow view of heaven and hell. I do indeed, brother, he thundered at me. I do indeed. It was obvious he felt we were headed in different directions. Maurice Rawlings, a cardiologist in Knoxville, Tennessee, has been on the front line in operating rooms where he has seen numerous people die and revive. He says we are not hearing about negative near-death experiences because no one wants to admit they've been to hell and back. Unless you're on the floor with the patient resuscitating, at the time, the heat of battle, uh, at the time of their experience, why are you fighting me off, John? What do you see? Is there fire down there? Is the devil there? What's there? Uh, then it all comes out. It's not sublimated into painless portions of the memory. You've caught them red-handed. They can't deny it. It's there. The negative experiences are always been there. They just haven't been captured because the psychologists, psychiatrists that interview these patients for a living, collecting cases of after-death experiences, haven't resuscitated one of the individuals they're reporting. How is somebody going to report a negative experience when they won't even tell their family? It's an F on the report card. Ron Regan spent a good part of his early life stealing, extorting, and beating people up until the unlucky day he came out at the bottom end of a fight, slashed by a bottle and bleeding to death in an ambulance. And I didn't know what was happening. I thought the ambulance was on fire. And as it filled with thick black smoke, moving through the thick black cloud, almost like an opening in this thick blackness, and at some point, I begin to hear screams, multitudes of people screaming and wailing. And the best way I can describe it is it, it looked like a, a volcanic crater. And I could see like a huge lake inside this, but it was blazing with fire. I never seen anything like this with the exception of a, hundreds of gallons of gasoline poured on the surface of water and ignited. But even, even worse than the, the sight, I began to, to see and to know that these voices were coming from those flames. And then I began to see bodies, silhouettes of human beings screaming on fire, burning, but they weren't burning up. 
they were in, in an inferno of flames, but they were burning up. And they were screaming, and, and the smell, if you've ever smelled burning flesh, it was unbearable, and the screams were unbearable, but the most horrible thing was the pain, the emotional pain of loneliness and separation. And I saw other people, and they're saying, Ronnie, don't come here. There's no way out. Ron Reagan became a Christian minister preaching the gospel from his own experience. Well, I have nothing against becoming a Christian minister. After all, I became one myself. But I have to admit that many researchers in the field of paranormal experience see these kinds of claims as culturally determined. We die the life we live, that the events of our own life are replayed when we die, and that our own religious beliefs and culture is mirrored back and reflected to us in the type of dying experience that we have. So it should not come as any surprise then that people who report hellish experiences are primarily fundamentalist Christians who have a deep belief in hell. To other people the mere idea is absurd. It worries me that most ND reports are coming from the States where there is this underlying Christian belief about heaven and hell. People like Arthur Susan Blackmore, once a parapsychologist herself, but now a debunker of myths about the afterlife. I think there may be people who have had unpleasant NDEs, frightening NDEs, who don't dare talk about it because they feel oh, that must mean I'm a bad person. And so they're really, really frightened and live with a kind of guilt that there must be something they've done wrong. If the truth is that it's just the luck of the draw, what the situation they were in and the chemicals in their brain at the time that produced this hellish NDE, they are suffering guilt for nothing, a remorse for nothing, bad feelings for nothing. And therefore, I think the sooner we can understand these things properly, the sooner we can help people like that see that it's not their fault that they had a hellish NDE. Psychiatrist Dr. Stanislav Grof, who has spent a lifetime studying altered states, speculates that hell may in fact exist in another dimension of time and space. So I see this as a real contact with the archetypal domain that is kind of independent existence, but, but uh, somehow touches upon that. If you look at um, the images of hells from different cultures, you'll see the different tortures that are being experienced there. You can see the nooses, uh, the, the strangling, you can see the, the pitchforks, uh, you know, the, the spits, the sharp pains, uh, people cooking in, uh, or being cooked in uh, cauldrons and so on. So experiencing certain extreme uh, emotional and physical states. When we think about uh, heaven as it is described in spiritual scriptures, not as a as a powerful inner archetypal experience, but as the physical heaven, then we come to such conclusions that we have disproved the existence of angels and God because we have explored systematically the astronomical heavens and we haven't seen any of those entities. Or if we know that uh, there is heated uh, nickel and iron as the core of the earth, that there is no place for caves of Satan uh, that cannot be held there. So the idea is to get to hell or to heaven, uh, you change your consciousness. So somebody can be here with us and be in heaven or hell, while everybody else is in Mill Valley. Those two, are not, uh, those two are not incompatible in any way. So those are very, very real experiences, uh, and they have to be studied by consciousness research. Uh, there's nothing that you can, you can say reasonably about heaven or hell coming from physics or coming from biology or coming from uh, from medicine because we are talking about states of states of mind of course the torches of hell are not quite the same to all people not even to all artists. To some, 
They are good for a last laugh. As that old atheist Voltaire lay on his deathbed, an ever hopeful priest tried to convince him to recant. At the very least to forswear the devil, Voltaire shook his head. Is this any time to be making new enemies, he murmured. Most people seem to crave for evidence of life after death. And I think this is quite natural because we spend our lives almost being taught that we matter. You know, I must get a bigger car or a bigger bank balance. I must have people love me and approve of me. I must be nice to them so they'll like me. All of these things are me, me, me. In a way, that's the root of all our suffering. I mean, that's what makes us miserable and disappointed and feeling a failure and so on. And I think it's also what drives the desire for me to carry on forever. Because what's all this been for if I'm not going to carry on and reap the reward somewhere or another? Also, there's the question of suffering. It seems sort of to give an answer to the problem of all the suffering around us if we think that somewhere people will get their just desserts. I personally don't think any of that's true because I don't think there is a little me in here who matters. After um, researching a number of the life reviews, I was amazed to discover my own prejudice as a member of this culture, that we tend to look in terms of up, down. You're a good girl, you're a bad girl. You're a sheep, you're a goat. You go to heaven, you go to hell. That there's a, a paradigm of opposites that may not, in fact, be true. So, is there a hell? I don't think so. Have we focused more on the blissful near-death experiences uh, rather than the others? Absolutely. We have to wonder why wonderful scholarship has discovered that medieval near-death experiencers saw lakes of fire, frightening folks, and then saw the bliss at the end. And contemporary near-death experiences are almost unilaterally blissful. Um, you have to wonder if it's because we live in a society that doesn't want to be accountable for its wrongdoing and doesn't want to admit that there may be a darker side to life. Um, I think those issues are real, and I think we need to um, encourage people who have had scary experiences to come forward. We create our own heaven and hell. Um, it's all relative. And uh, in terms of heaven, it's uh, when we feel good, we're in heaven. And when we're in, in, in the pits, we're, we're in hell. L'enfer, ça serait un endroit où on doit continuer à, où on continue à être entouré de gens qui euh, ne savent pas s'assumer. Euh, on est entouré d'hypocrisie, de, euh, de mensonges, euh, de pensées négatives. I mean, if heaven is defined as we're all part of uh, a much larger being, then uh, hell is, is sort of not being um, completely at peace with that, that sort of thought. So it, it's an, an internal thing as opposed to an external thing. L'enfer serait vraiment euh, un endroit où, où le, la sensualité ne se développerait pas du tout, ne s'épanouirait pas du tout, mais au contraire, la, la partie la plus, la plus basse et la plus mauvaise de l'homme se, se contenterait d'exister. There are other hells, beside the traditional Christian one. Darkness. Void. Vacuum. Loneliness. Absence. Nothingness. Non-existence. What I knew was that I was outside of the hospital, um, going into the sky. Patsy, you never existed. You never will exist. 35 years ago, Nancy Evans Bush may have experienced the kind of hell referred to by Stan Groff when something went terribly wrong during childbirth. She has been trying to make sense of what happened ever since. 
You're not real. You never existed. Nothing you ever knew existed. You're not real. You never existed. Uh, you never will exist. Nor does anyone you think you ever knew. Nor your life. Nor where you live. You made it all up. You were allowed to make it up. Um, which meant that not only did I not exist, I said, I remember saying telepathically, uh, but the baby. The baby doesn't exist. Her year old sister doesn't exist. Your mother, your husband, nobody you know exists. You're not real. And Nothing you know is real. It's, I, I've called it instant holocaust. Nancy believes she has come to terms with the hell she experienced so many years ago. But what about those people whose near-death experiences threw them into hell and who found no hope, no redemption, no promise of anything better, who came back to this life with the sense that all they have to look forward to is perpetual misery. There is a gift in these experiences. Now, it's not a gift we want to get. But if we're stubborn enough, and for some of us, this is the only benefit we've ever found for our stubbornness, but if we hang in there, we work through a lot of issues. We come to discover our religious faith in, in incredibly deep ways that we couldn't if we just kind of dazzled around on the happy level. So what I'm trying to do is go beyond just the idea of pain equals bad equals punishment equals hell equals eternity equals despair. Because the alternative to despair, I think, is joy, which is different than happiness. But the paradoxical nature of this is that in order to get to real joy, we have to be able to accept suffering as part of it. And I know that sounds bizarre, but I didn't make up the rules. And it just seems to work that way. In many ways, the concept of hell is the most difficult of all ideas of the afterlife for contemporary people to deal with. All of us have had moments of pure happiness or supreme exaltation about which we can truly say it was heaven. But hell is a different story. When we say something was hell, we don't mean it in quite the same way. Implicit in our idea of hell is the potential and the need to be released from it. When they made a movie about the most decorated soldier of World War II, they called it To Hell and Back. As far as I know, nobody's ever made a movie simply called To Hell, which is probably what's most nerve-wracking about hellish NDEs, that uncertainty about escape. Nancy Evans Bush, like any believing Christian, finds reason in her experience by affirming that only through suffering comes ultimate joy. But what if, as some hellish NDEs seem to demonstrate, it doesn't? A troubling question. And to be candid at this point, until more research into hellish NDEs has been done, I'm perfectly content not to know the answer. I went to heaven. As I was approaching it, I heard wind chimes 
well, it was a sound like wind chimes, but it was every conceivable tone you could imagine. It was awesome. I also heard hymns being sung, and the hymns were being sung simultaneously, but you could hear each individual one. Now that sounds totally ridiculous, but there was a great harmony about this tone, and it was a uh, liquid, silvery. It was a uh, beautiful, and this tone permeated all. It was in the it. garden setting. And I looked down into a valley, and at the end of the valley, I saw this mountain. And, uh, there was a tremendous uh, waterfall. It was beautiful. And the water just cascaded down over this, down the mountainside. And to the left, there was like a vortex of light, like a tunnel of light. And I knew that that was home where I had come from. It's really not the light that. that impressed me it was it was the feeling uh, it was a feeling of peace uh, gentleness at oneness with with the universe if you please with life with everything. something i'm floating back in that sky well, suddenly i'm at that moment where everything ends but everything's there and just heaven on earth it was beautiful and it was scary Vicky Umepeg is a blind musician. When she ended up in a terrible car accident, she saw for the first time in her life. I went up through the ceiling as if it were nothing at all. And then I was sucked into this aperture or trough or whatever you want to call it. I really don't know. It was a thing, tunnel. And then I was ejected out on this grass, and there were flowers and birds and trees and people. Flowers, birds, angels, glowing light, deceased loved ones, images of love and warmth, even Jesus himself. Of course, an NDE is only one way of approaching the question of heaven. Does it exist? And if it does, what is it like? But since these experiences are so graphic, it's a good place to start. According to Coming Back to Life, PMH Atwater's study of near-death experiences, 90% of all NDEs are positive. In other words, 9 out of 10 of us think we're headed for the pearly gates. Mally Cox Chapman's book, The Case for Heaven, tells the stories of near-death experiencers who died and went to heaven, and then came back to talk about it. When I started researching the case for heaven, I looked at the world religions, um, what each major religion said about the afterlife, to see how they compared and contrasted. And I set up a tutorial with an astrophysicist to see if I could reconcile 20th century science with what we know about faith. So I've got to admit, I believed in heaven because when I was four years old, my grandmother told me there was heaven, and I believed my grandmother. But as an adult, I thought it was intellectually tacky. Um, astronauts had proven it wasn't in the sky, and Freud had made it pretty clear that wishful thinking exists. So I studied and studied, and after about a year on religions and science, um, I began to think I knew something, which was probably a bad sign. And I gave a lecture in a small country church in Connecticut, and I was telling a Buddhist story that's rather dismissive of the afterlife. The Buddha was very intent on keeping his followers this worldly. And a woman at the back of the room was shaking her head in disgust. I thought that was pretty interesting and stopped my talk and called on her. And she said, I know there's a heaven because I've been there. And proceeded to tell her congregation of something that had happened to her 23 years before that she'd never told anyone. Of being in the hospital miscarrying her fifth child. When suddenly she felt a cold dark chill and then enveloped by a warm and comforting light. And she heard a baby cry in the light and was given to understand that the baby would stay in the light and was fine, but that she herself had to go back to Earth, that her work on Earth was not yet done. When she came back, there was a sheet over her head. She had been pronounced dead by the doctor on call. When she pulled the sheet down over her head, the nurse in the room shrieked and had to be sent home for the day. Now, Dorothy has no fear of death and is absolutely sure that someday, when her work on Earth is done, 
she will see her daughter in heaven. Now what surprised me and had an emotional impact on me was the consequence of Dorothy's story to her congregation. Uh, this was not some flaky weirdo. This was not some egghead who thought she knew a lot about religion. This was the police dispatcher in town, an utterly trustworthy neighbor. She was the lay leader of her church. And it occurred to me suddenly that faith is a three-legged stool. It is scriptures from all the different traditions. It's the traditions that come out of those scriptures that our churches and mosques and synagogues teach us. But there's a third leg, and that's contemporary experience, and that I needed to learn more about it. Although Tina Wolf was raised as a Buddhist, her glimpse of paradise bears a remarkable resemblance to the heaven described by other experiencers. When I, um, I had a heart attack, of course I didn't know till afterwards, but I had a beautiful sight. It's almost like a spring, and I was this side of the river, and I know I cannot swim, but I hear the warm, gentle voice calling me from the other side, and I'm trying to cross the river, but I cannot find any boat or the bridge to cross over. But this scene, especially the green, I never saw the, such a soft, warm green. And I was so peaceful. I wanted to cross over, but I just couldn't. The existence of heaven in human thinking was an important consideration for Tom Harper, Rhodes Scholar, journalist, and author of Life After Death, as he researched his book. Near-death experiences seem to suggest that heavenly realms are just on the other side of death's door. But there's another way to approach the question, looking outward instead of in. The fact is that every culture, every religion, every people in history has come up with its own version of heaven its destination for the spirit after death. They must have something to tell us, or else a lot of very bright people have been wasting a lot of time. There definitely is a heaven, and I have seen it, and uh, I saw the flowers and the trees and everything else there, yes, I have seen all of it. Well, in certain conceptions, heaven can seem pretty dull, and in others, pretty incredible. But putting aside the specifics, all views of heaven seem to see it as a kind of reunion with a force greater than the individual, and to view death as a gateway to this reunion. Unfortunately, no one ever brings back documentation. The closest we come are the experiences of people who have nearly died and have begun the transition. They've taken the first steps of the passage to where they're going. Heaven is the word we have in this language for a reality that is beyond words. It's a kind of cultural tagline that all of us understand. My experiencers of the 50 that I interviewed are actually quite modest about their claim of what they saw or how far they got or whether or not they actually were dead or participated in an afterlife. One of my experiencers said, you know, I got to the gate but you have to go through the gate to get to the fun part. Another experiencer saw a beautiful golden tree composed of tiny little golden lights, which she understood to be the souls of lots of people who loved her. I am not in a position, and I don't think anyone is, having studied heaven for five years, to describe heaven. All I can do is say I have so many stories and so much evidence of people who've traveled right up to the edge, um, that we can afford to trust it. Uh, I believe that there is uh, a fulfillment in heaven in the sense that, that if I have been given something and didn't have a chance or out of fear didn't do something with what I was given, uh, that, that in heaven that can be fulfilled. And I believe that, that heaven would be that kind of fulfillment, uh, that sort of finishing of the person. But I also believe that heaven would be dynamic because God has created a dynamic universe. 
I mean, my heart's beating, I'm breathing, uh, all kinds of stuff's happening, blood is coursing through my veins, the world is dynamic, relationships are dynamic, and therefore, if God is where heaven is, then that's dynamic too. So I don't see sitting on a bunch of clouds with a bunch of angels uh, uh, playing harps as any kind of a, a vision. Buddha said that the deliverance from suffering is the only salvation. Man must escape the enslavement of earthly desires. He must divest himself of all illusion of individuality and become one with the universe. Then, and only then, can he enter into the simultaneous extinction and ultimate bliss that is nirvana. To reach heaven is to enter into Buddhahood, to become God. Nothing remains in nirvana except goodness and purity. There was this anthropologist who was doing uh, research on, uh, uh, on death and dying among elderly people. So he went to South Korea and visited this uh, old age home where the occupants were uh, primarily Buddhists. And to his great surprise, and uh, these people facing death and dying, they were not so much afraid of death and dying. And the anxiety level was uh, much very low. And then uh, the reason he found was, is, um, you know, they, they don't, you know, they don't have the same concept of death, you know, as uh, people who believe in single life system have. You know, I mean, this is not the end. This is not the extinction. It's merely like you go through winter-like period, you see. So it's uncomfortable, but you know, there's a reassurance, you know, like, uh, and then you'll come to spring. It's like when the winter comes, spring would not be far behind, you see. So there's hope, you know, and they'll have another opportunity. Islam is a faith of judgment. The Quran asserts, and we will set up a just balance so no soul shall be dealt with unjustly. And although there be the weight of a mustard seed, we will bring it forth and take account. And if the deceased has been a true believer, Allah will reward them for their steadfastness with a garden and a raiment of silk. Reclining therein upon couches, they will find there is neither excessive heat nor cold. Its clustered fruits will be brought within easy reach, and there will wait upon them youths who will not age. According to the Quran, heaven is what you would like it to be. It is the ideal utopia. So you'll, face, you'll have huris, you will have uh, spouses, you will have uh, fruits, you will have uh, everything that your heart could desire. The Quran vividly describes the events on the day of judgment, wherein a sort of a scroll or a book, if you like, will be placed in front of each and every person and recounting each and every minor or major deed or misdeeds which he or she has committed uh, in this world. And uh, they will then be judged according to their deeds. And if the good deeds outweigh the evil ones, the person will go to heaven. And if the evil deeds outweigh the good ones, he or she will go to hell. In traditional native belief, the spiritual and the natural are a unity. Death is part of the life process, and only those who have no idea how to live are fearful of dying. Death is the gateway to our return to the spiritual world. The spirit returns with the setting sun to the sacred way to reunite with the oneness of the earth. For the Ojibwe people, the land of the dead is like a place of plenty. I think it's because people, native people, traditionally have been hunters and gatherers and had a, a very difficult life. So in the afterlife, there's plenty of game to hunt. Um, there's plenty of food. In Ojibwe traditions and myths, there's a lot of mention of uh, lots of berries, blueberries, strawberries, raspberries. Uh, so there's an abundance of food, but always in, in the land of the dead, that's where you, you will find your ancestors and your friends who have passed on. Betty Eady is the author of a worldwide bestseller entitled Embraced by the Light. During surgery at the age of 31, 
she literally died and went to heaven. Today, Betty travels widely and lectures about what happened to her. I saw this pinpoint of light, and this pinpoint of light uh, attracted me. So I turned and I began to travel very quickly, and the light became broader and, and bigger. Um, the love that was coming from that light began to surround me. And as I came to that intense light, I was taken to a, a garden. And I say garden because it was so manicured. And uh, there was a tremendous uh, waterfall. It was beautiful. And the water just cascaded down over this, down the mountainside. And everything there was alive. It had, um, it had uh, spirit. And I could see the beautiful flowers, and they were gorgeous. They were beyond, they are beyond any description. The colors, uh, the fragrance, again, they, they moved and swayed uh, in perfect harmony to a melody that they, that they produced, also very perfect for God. And, um, as I came closer to the pond, I looked over, leaned over, and kind of brushed the water to look down into it. And when I did, I saw my spirit for the first time, and I marveled at what was now my parents, because instead of that, I'm going to cry, so I'm going to have to stop for a minute. <laughs> if you don't mind. I imagine that Betty Edie had a near-death experience, a profound experience that really changed her. I think the problem is that she has interpreted it in terms of her own Christian upbringing and has become absolutely rigid about the way of interpreting it. I think she's not at all open to any kind of other interpretation than a very fundamental Christian view that the God she met was the God of her own type of Christianity. I think her experience, like every other experience, was a product of, of her brain. And I think it's a shame that she is pushing this view of, you know, I know the truth and you're all wrong. Because her truth is not by any means the same as other NDEs or other people who've had mystical experiences. And I think that sort of rigid view does more harm than good. Here's something to consider. What do we need heaven for anyway? A skeptic might argue that heaven and hell are nothing more than a system of rewards and punishments we use to justify our own actions and to condemn those of people we don't like. Or perhaps as a way to keep certain people in power and promise others a reward after death, provided they don't make trouble in this life. Is that the real heaven? Pie in the sky when you die, by and by? The promise of prizes? I think both the notion of heaven and hell uh, are tied to the notion of uh, justice and retribution uh, that uh, in a cosmic sense uh, that uh, if we live in a universe that makes sense uh, then we live in a universe that is in, in a sense fair uh, and uh, and that means that there must be I think some uh, final drawing of the line uh, that uh, certain people shouldn't get away with certain things and other people uh, shouldn't have to put up with what they put up with and that's been a traditional argument in favor of some kind of afterlife to start with and then some kind of recompense at that stage you know a lot of people probably many more than will admit it have undergone out-of-body experiences that they feel brought them close to heaven indeed in some cases all the way there and a great many more people believe they will encounter such an experience based on the sacred texts and the teachings of their religion. Is it all merely wish projection? Or is there truly a different dimension as the vast majority have always thought? In the final analysis, most of us believe or intuitively think and hope there is.
first image that came to my mind was my hands holding onto a cold railing. When Darrell Rooney was young, he found himself inexplicably fascinated by the story of the Titanic. Years later, during a hypnotic regression with Betty Binder, he remembered a past life that ended aboard the ill-fated liner and spontaneously recalled some of the names of other crew members, which he was later able to verify against old crew lists. He was not eager to tell his story, but because of the seriousness of our investigation, he agreed to an interview with us. So I'm out on the poop deck or something like that, and seeing you know, these faint objects in the distance, and these objects are the lifeboats. And I can see that the davits are empty, and the lifeboats are out there, and that I'm staring my fate in, in the face. Uh, the lifeboats are gone, I'm gonna go down with the ship. It's a memory that has terror attached to it. So, it, I mean, it's even disturbing to talk about it a little bit right now. The thing that really sticks out to me is the sound of timber cracking, creaking and cracking the way it's not supposed to. This heavy, heavy, twisting sound. And emotional confusion everywhere. Things turning upside down and hitting water, getting caught up in ropes. So this is obviously when the ship broke up and sank. And the sense of the hull of the ship there, portholes and then getting pulled down into the darkness of uh, this freezing cold water. And I remember all of the emotion that was attached to that, that this was a really terrifying, uh, terrifying moment to be experiencing. And the thing that, that made it really profound was, you know, it just was going, 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 and then all of a sudden, all of the emotion just vanished. And uh, I was asked what happened that caused me to uh, become calm. And uh, what I said was that I separated from my body. And that's how, it, that's how I experienced it. Darrow came to me because he was afraid of the middle of the ocean. He was not afraid of seashores. I asked him what was scary for him. And he said, drowning in the middle of the ocean and being eaten by sharks. And he thought I would find that kind of strange, but I didn't. He was feeling very comfortable that I was accepting him whatever his beliefs and experiences were. You know, I don't go around telling people that uh, I had a past life on the Titanic. And, um, you know, for obvious reasons, because it's, uh, people don't always take kindly to it. But the reason that I'm willing to talk about it uh, is not so much about that experience as what the whole thing's about. The Daryl Rooney that I met in about 1981 um, had some bleed through from past life uh, memories and in some ways was very different. The, the uh, personality who was on the Titanic was very nose to the grindstone. He worked in a boiler room, and he went to work, and in his off time, he would go up one deck to uh, the bar, and he'd hang out with his buddies, and he never had any uh, life beyond his work. And he never went topside until the ship was sinking. And he came to do regression, not related to his work, but related to a phobia that didn't seem to make sense. Stories like Daryl Rooney's convinced Tom Harper, theologian, journalist, and best-selling author of Life After Death, that the whole concept of reincarnation needed special consideration. When I came to this point of my research, I knew that reincarnation, the idea that we keep coming back until we get it right, so to speak, was believed in by some early Christians. I was also aware, of course, that nearly two-thirds of humanity have always believed in it in one form or another, over many thousands of years. It was important for me, therefore, to look at it as objectively as possible. I think we keep coming back because we have to learn new lessons and whatever we're going through now, it's, we're, you know, back in school for something. Suffering 103 or whatever. 
Because there are too many people on earth to die and go to heaven because heaven would be awfully crowded. You know? <laughs> And so that's that's why I think that that you know people are reincarnated. Mon âme sortira de de mon enveloppe charnelle puisqu'elle ne pourra plus y, y rester et elle repartira dans les ténèbres et elle attendra qu'un autre corps soit libre et souhaite l'accueillir pour continuer à, à développer d'autres vies sur terre. Sinon, elle continuera ses activités, mais en dehors du corps humain. The soul is sort of like energy, and what Einstein says about energy neither being created nor destroyed, but only transferred to another form, is basically what I believe about in spirituality, that the soul also is never destroyed, but merely goes on to another body. Um, apparently, one of them was I was a street urchin, <laughs> and I've been a male in, a, in past lives. Um, I can see that, and there's a, I have a fair bit of androgyny. And uh, identify, I identify on a fairly male plane, right? I may pose something that will be very disquieting to, to, to people or to those fates and people who think that there's only one life. But the reincarnation is the only rational answer that so far we can find for the inequities and disparities in life. Why has one born blind? Why some people are born handicapped? Mozart was born a genius at age four. He wrote his first great musical what accounts for that if there is a God and this God believes in justice and he created all of us why should he create one better than me why should someone suffer more than I do why should someone enjoy the bliss of life why others are suffering. And our answer is a reincarnation. My first recollection of a past life experience was with a trained facilitator where I did several sessions with her and then after feeling comfortable with the concept of how memories can come up, I began to have my own spontaneous past life memories. The most significant one for me was a lifetime in Europe and I remember being a rather young woman and being dressed in rather coarse clothing, muslin type material. There were three or four children there. I was trying to prepare a meal just out of water and vegetables caring for them. There was no husband around and the next memory that popped out of that was that he had gone away to war and he wasn't going to be returning. I had been left alone and of course that information began to dovetail with my own feelings of abandonment that I'd had all my life. So in one life Denise Lampron tells us she was an impoverished farm woman in medieval Europe. In another she was reincarnated as a Native American male warrior. My Native American experience, well, in that one, I was a male, I was a warrior, which is the issue, is, is basically the same, just experienced it differently. I lost my spouse again in that lifetime, see, we're continuing with the same theme, and lost from my tribe for something that I believed in, which again is another issue in my life. My beliefs have always sort of segregated me from the group. So that was one where it was made clear to me that I was willing to suffer for what I believed in, or to sacrifice, let me put it that way, for what I believed in. Obviously, she believes what she says. But do we? To Christians, the idea that we can change, improve ourselves as we progress from one life to another, runs counter to some central doctrines. For example, the unique importance of having only one life to live in this world the resurrection of the body, a final judgment, and even heaven itself.
whether famous, obscure, rich, poor, oriental, Indian, black, white, a surprising number of people all over the world claim to have had previous life experiences. General George Patton spoke openly about his past lives. When one of his superiors said to him, George, you should have been with Napoleon, he replied with all seriousness, oh, but I was. But how can people be sure that they are experiencing a past life? How does the process actually occur? Today, it is often with the assistance of a facilitator. Betty Bender is the president of the Association for Past Life Research and Therapies. Well, what I'm finding is that there's an increasing interest in past life regression, in remembering our past lives, and in the application of this modality to improving the present and improving our what we might call psychic experiences or our meditational abilities. I feel in part it's because people are looking for alternative healing modalities. In part it's because people are starting to remember their past lives or snippets of them and they want to make sense of it. And in part there's just a tremendous curiosity about it. Dr. Stanislav Grof's research into the mind and consciousness began in Czechoslovakia before he arrived at the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center in the late 60s. Today, he practices in California. Anybody who is doing work with non-ordinary states with, with open, an open mind will see um, powerful past life experiences. It's, it's simply one uh, type of experiences that, that occur that belong to the spectrum of non-ordinary states. So you will see people uh, experiencing episodes from, from other centuries, from other countries and so on, uh, with um, a sense of personal remembering, not just having that experience, but having a sense, I was once that person. This is not the first time uh, it's happening to me. Uh, the, the people find powerful connections to their, to their present life, and it has this sort of healing, uh, healing impact when they complete that kind of experience. Now, these are simply facts of observation. Now the interpretation of these observations in terms of survival of the same unit of consciousness is just one of the possible theories. It's a very good one. It's certainly much better than what we have in, in traditional psychiatry where the whole thing is just discarded as, as uh, nonsense. I think the whole idea of reincarnation is incoherent. On the surface it's a sort of attractive idea uh, and it deals with the problem of suffering, you know, why should I have such a terrible life? Well, because I did something bad in a past life. Why should I be frightened of heights because something happened to me in the past life and so on? But really, if you think what it could possibly mean, what could be reincarnated? For reincarnation, personal reincarnation to make any kind of sense, there has to be a soul or a spirit or a me or something rather with memories. The whole idea wouldn't make much sense if we don't bring our memories from one life to the next. And clearly, on the whole, we don't. So I have enormous troubles with the whole idea of reincarnation in its more trivial sense, personal reincarnation. So when I read evidence for young children in India apparently remembering past lives, I have no idea what's going on. Much of it, if it's true, could be interpreted as telepathy, clairvoyance, other things if you believe in those. But in any case, I am not convinced by the evidence we have yet from hypnotic regression to past lives, none of those have really convinced me that they show the continuity of something from life to life. But other researchers would answer Dr. Blackmore by pointing out that there is evidence for reincarnation. Dr. Joel Witten, a psychiatrist and professor at the University of Toronto and the author of Life Between Life, is one of those who tackles the question head on. What is the evidence for the case for reincarnation? Uh, Ian Stevenson and other very careful researchers have methodically documented people's memory and gone out and verified the accuracy of recall. Uh, for example, uh, a child may report being such and such a person in such a, a certain town, uh, they did this, they lived at this address, 
they were married to this person. And Ian uh, or his researchers will interview the, the, the child, get the description, and then go to this place. And Ian Stevenson has well over 2,000 such cases. The bottom line was no one could find fault with his research, with the investigations. And the conclusion was you either accept the hypothesis, the notion of reincarnation, or you're forced to accept the hypothesis of super telepathy. Equal, each of them are, to the Western mind, equally implausible, incomprehensible. And yet, that's what the data says. It's an uh, endless journey. And we living beings are travelers. This is uh, known in Buddhism as uh, samsara, or uh, will of life. That means cycle of uh, continued existences, or succession of a rebirth that an enlightened being goes through different forms of uh, existences. In Buddhism, we view living and dying in successive waves as divided into uh, three divisions. Present life and future life and intermediate stage or baldo that takes place between the present life and the future life. In other words, it is important to understand that in Buddhism, life and death is not one's only event. The wheel of life. That raises a great many interesting questions. Do we, for example, retain any of the characteristics of our previous existence in a new one? Can we in some way choose our next incarnation? And perhaps the most interesting of all to me, if we've had past lives, why don't we remember them? There are several responses to that. Um, one is perhaps we haven't had any past lives. This might be our first incarnation. That is a possibility. Um, I have another uh, case where a person hasn't incarnated for so long that they can't, there, there's nothing they can relate to, sort of like a caveman existence. But children, by and large, do remember. It's been my experience and the experience of many people who are familiar with the idea of reincarnation. If you take a child who's three or four that has sufficient language to understand what you mean, many children can simply tell you, oh, my, my name was Ethel and I was, uh, worked on a farm and I was married to Sam and uh, I think I had four kids. And I think I remember dying when I was 82 or something. Here in the, in the West, it seems that once a child enters the school system, these memories just get repressed or disappear from consciousness. And then later, as an adult, 20, 30, whatever, we have to struggle to try and remember. We're more than just what's, uh, what's inside of our bodies. I certainly feel like I'm more than just who I am right now. What I do know from everything that I've studied and experienced is that something's out there and that we have access to consciousness more than just our own. And um, it seems to be a lot of times from a particular point of view, which to me suggests reincarnation. 
Reincarnation is a huge and complicated subject, and I might add, very difficult to summarize. To be honest, I personally find the evidence intriguing, but I remain as yet unconvinced. Nevertheless, I find that Dale Kernahan's questions underline the essence of what so many find appealing about reincarnation. Why are some born with great physical limitations? Why do some suffer more than others? How do we resolve the great inequities between people? Reincarnation is certainly one answer. 